Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Olive Board. Uh, my name is Dinkar Purwar and I welcome you all in this session. I hope everybody is doing great and feeling healthy. Uh, and uh, I would just like to congratulate all the people who have cleared the phase one examinations. And uh, right now the phase two examination the dates have already been declared in the for the NABAR grade, exa grade examination. So uh, there are only 20 days that has been left uh, for your phase two examination. So I hope uh, your preparation are very good and uh, everything you are doing as per the schedule. Okay. So here I just would like to tell everybody that only focus on the important things which are uh, very necessary for the examination. Okay. So smart studying over here is the main key where you can do any uh, where you can do much of the work. Okay. Do not uh, just go for reading everything and all things. Okay, just focus on the question paper which have been asked uh, previous years. Then just match it to what type of questions and what type of answers they usually expect. Okay, so here a smart strategy will work. Okay, and as you all know that uh, we are providing you with all the descriptive question and answer, then essay writing practices, then even ESI, ERD, MCQs, all we are providing. So here we are just wanted to make sure that uh, your preparation is on well on the uh, on the right track. So just keep following the channel for the latest updates related to the NABAR examinations. Okay, and I think uh, right today we don't have much people over here. So just uh, those who are there, just uh, just tell me, uh, let me know. Okay, Nilesh, Nilesh is here. Uh, what about uh, how how Nilesh have you uh, what about your phase one uh, result can you just tell me in the chat box if it is possible if you want to write you can write it otherwise just leave it okay uh, if you wanted to tell okay so uh, we'll be starting with our uh, session right away okay okay congratulations congratulations Nilesh congratulations and uh, uh, just we are expecting you you clear the phase two also okay and uh, we'll just wanted to see you again we will interview over here in our channel okay so uh, we were just expecting you to clear all the phases of this examination okay congratulations for phase one result okay now we will be doing our uh, session five on current affairs here we'll be uh, asking 25 questions mcqs uh, so please uh, so let's start with the session okay now so question number one, which of the following crops can be mixed and broadcasted in a rain fit condition in a mixed intercropping pattern? Okay. So rice, wheat or jute, moong, maize or wheat, maize, green, pig, uh, green gram or pigeon pea, all of the above or none of the above. What, which one was that? Which of the following crops can be mixed? Which of the crops can be mixed and broadcasted in a rain fit condition? Which of the crops which we can do? Okay. Just tell me guys, uh, which of the crops can be mixed and broadcasted? Uh, let me see. Okay. Nilesh is saying B. That is all of the above. Okay. Uh, anybody else who wanted to answer this question? Please, those who just wanted to answer, just let me know. Uh, just uh, write it down over there. Okay. Please write it down. Okay, so we will be just checking the answer of this question. The answer of the question is option number three. That is maize, green pea and pigeon pea are the three crops which can be mixed and broadcasted in a rain fit condition. So the option number three is the correct answer. Okay, now here uh, raising true or more crops by mixing their seed or by without distinct row arrangement is known as mixed intercropping that is called mixed cropping so it is a very common practice in a rain fed or a dry farming area so generally legumes crops uh, like gram uh, red gram black gram cowpea or oil seed crop like groundnut mustard etc they are mixed with cereal crops like jowar bajra usually cereals are grown uh, as main crops and pulses or oil seeds are minor or mixed crop so normally some of the example of intercroppings are uh, wheat uh, and mustard can be grown together shorghum pigeon pea and sesame can be grown together maize green gram and pigeon pea can be uh, mixed together okay so the answer number is the third one okay now under uh, rashtri krishi vikas yojana what is the assistance provided for reclamation of alkaline or saline soil per hectare rupees 15000 per hectare rupees 30000 per hectare rupees 45000 per hectare rupees 60000 per hectare or rupees 75000 per hectare 
under RKBY, how much is uh, how much assistance per hectare is provided for reclamation of the soil? So uh, Nilesh is saying B, that is thirty thousand per hectare. Okay, anybody else wanted to answer this question? They can just answer it right away. Anybody who wanted to answer this question? Okay, fine. So the answer of this question is sixty thousand rupees per hectare. So here we are looking for rupees sixty thousand per hectare has been uh, assistance that has been provided for reclamation of alkaline or saline uh, saline soils. Okay, saline soils. Okay, and under R K V Y rupees sixty thousand per hectare has been providing assistance for reclamation of alkali or saline soil. Okay, now question number three. Which of the following statement is a correct about the fiscal deficit? First, fiscal deficit is reflective of a total borrowing requirement of the government. Second, high fiscal deficit uh, is always bad for the economy. Third one, it is the difference between the revenue receipt plus non-debt capital receipt and the total expenditure. Fourth one, both one and three or all of the above. Which one of the following or is are correct? Which of the following is is or are correct? May I know the answer, guys? Come on, come on! Please read the option clearly and let me know. So, uh, Nilesh is saying E. That is all of the options are correct. Okay, let's see. The answer of this question is both one and three. Both one and three. One is correct. That is, fiscal deficit is a reflective of total borrowing requirement of the government. Okay, how much the government has to borrow? Okay, then it is not always bad for economy. It is not always. Sometimes it is bad, but it is not always bad for the economy. Maybe higher fiscal deficit means that you are borrowing too much. Maybe you are borrowing for making the infrastructure projects. Okay, so if you are investing that money, that is the money that you are borrowing. If you are investing them in creating assets, then it is not bad. Okay, but if you are borrowing the money to pay the interest or other things. Uh, to uh, to uh, pro uh, to uh, clear off the loans with interest, so that is bad for the economy. Okay, so it is not always bad. Sometimes it is bad. Sometimes it is not bad. And third one, it is the difference between revenue receipt plus non debt capital receipt. It is correct. Okay, so our option number both one and three are correct. Okay, now. It is the difference between revenue receipt plus non-debt capital receipt and the total expenditure. The word fiscal deficit is a reflection of the total reflective or total borrowing requirement of the government. A high fiscal deficit can uh, can also good for the economy if the money is spent goes into the creation of productive assets. See, a high fiscal deficit is also good. If it is going for creation of productive assets like highways, road, ports, or airports, from where we can earn the money, okay? So if we are borrowing the money for creating the productive assets, then it is good for economy, okay? Okay. So this is the answer. Now, direction for question number four to five. In the economic survey 2020, mentioned the road tap, okay? R O D T E P has the road tap scheme has been. Uh, mentioned in the report, the road tap scheme was announced by the government of India in September 2019 to boost the export by allowing the reimbursement of taxes and duties, okay, which are not exempted or refunded under any other schemes in accordance with the WTO norms. The benefit of road tap would be available subject to the condition, restriction, exclusion, ineligibility, and fulfilment of the procedural requirement as notified. On export eligible for road tap, the road tap to be implemented with end-to-end -end digitization from first of January twenty twenty-one. Did everybody has read the paragraph? Just let me know in the chat box if you have read the paragraph. Do let me know if you have read. This is about road tap scheme. Okay, so you have read it. Okay, now. Now we are asking the question over here. So, what does R stands for in road tap scheme mentioned above? Relief, regulation, reimbursed, registered, or remission. What is that? What does R stands in road tap scheme mentioned above? Relief, regulation, reimbursed, registered, or remission. 
may i know okay start answering guys so nilesh is saying e that is remission okay remissions so can you write the full form of this can you write the full form nilesh uh, for this road tab scheme remission just write it down simply i just i will understand no problem you can just write down okay see i can see many people in the chat box but only one person is answering uh, may i know what is the problem if people are facing any problem just let me know or otherwise if you wanted to answer you can answer it okay P please participate in the session okay please participate in the session do not feel that uh, may i may be wrong or i may be right or uh, that doesn't matter okay remission on duties and taxes okay duties and taxes on export products okay okay yes 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 okay so please do not feel shy do not feel shy okay so road tap that is remission okay now remission on duty and taxes on export products okay that is the full form okay now the second question related to the paragraph is under the following is and are the benefits of road tap scheme what are the benefits of road trap scheme road tap scheme provides a seamless flow of economic benefit from the government the scheme will help export meet international standard and boost business growth it will add more competitiveness in the foreign market will assure duties benefit by government of india all of the above over and so uh, what will be the answer for this which of the following are the benefits come on guys answer which of the following are the benefits so nilesh is saying e that is 1 and 2 okay anybody else who wanted to answer this anybody else who wanted to answer this okay so here the answer is all of the above the answer is all of the above all of the above are the benefits of road tap scheme okay so road tap scheme will replace the popular merchandise export from india schemes and the later has been found to violate the global trade norms following the complaint from the usa and the world trade organization so it will provide a seamless flow of economic benefit from the government okay it uh, in the existing scheme certain taxes such as state or these are the things it will add more competitiveness in the foreign market this is the second first point this is the second point being more compliant and transparent with the regulator it with the export it will meet the international standard to boost the business growth this is the third point so all of the above are the answer all of the above so answer is all of the above answer is all of the above okay right now question number 6 as per the union budget 2021 22 which of the following are the twin objective of custom duty policy as per the union budget 21 22 which of the following are the twin objective of custom duty and policy promoting domestic manufacturing promoting foreign manufacturing helping india gets on the global value chain and export better 1 and 3 or 2 and 3 as per the union budget which of the following are the twin objective of custom duty policy so nilesh is saying d that is 1 and 3 promoting domestic manufacturing and helping india gets onto the global chain so okay so uh, let's see uh, let's see the answer the answer of the question is 1 and 3 very good nilesh so very good answering good answering so here the option number 1 and 3 are correct that is promoting domestic manufacturing and also helping india get to the global value chain and export better okay now on the issue of custom duty the finance minister informed that it has been the twin objective of promoting domestic manufacturing and helping india get on to the global value chain and export better okay now question number 7 range of phosphorus considered favorable for better productivity in fish culture in 60 to 120 ppm parts per million 40 to 50 ppm 100 to 120 ppm 10 to 20 ppm or none of the above range of phosphorus how much range of phosphorus is considered for better productivity in fish culture 
So Nellius is saying A that is 60 to 120 ppm. Uh, nobody else is answering. Uh, many people are present but they are not answering. They are not participating in the session. Guys, please uh, participate in the session because this motivates us to bring more session like this. If you are not participating, then we have to also check uh, whether to come with sessions or not. Okay, so please participate so that at least we, uh, whatever the work we are doing, uh, we, uh, it can help you in getting something uh, for your exam and all those things. Okay, so because it takes a lot of hard work for making all these type of things. So please participate in the session so that uh, so that effort that we, we have put on it, on all these things uh, should not get wasted. Okay, so please. So the answer of this question is A, that is first one, 20 or uh, 60 to 120 ppm is the range of phosphorus that is considered good for fish culture productivity. Okay, now phosphorus is an essential element in the living organism and exists in the water mosses as dissolved and particle forms. Phosphorus is required for optimum growth, feed, uh, feed efficiency, bone development and maintenance of the acid base regulations. Okay. Then for presence of high concentration, the presence of high con uh, concentration of phosphate in water may indicate presence of pollution also. Okay, for fish production, 0.2 ppm dissolved nitrogen, 60 to 120 ppm phosphorus is considered ideal for fish product productivity. Okay, now question number eight. According to the economic survey 2020-21, to promote the financial inclusion, the overall priority sector lending target for urban cooperative banks has been increased to what percentage? 45%, 49%, 56%, 65% or 75%. So Nilesh is saying E that is 75%. What is the target for uh, urban cooperative banks to provide financial inclusion to priority sector lending? How much priority sector lending uh, they have to do for urban cooperative banks? So Nilesh is saying E. So let's see the answer. The answer of this question is E only that is 75%. Very good Nilesh. Good answering. Good preparation. Very good. Uh, so I, I, I am just very sure that you will be clearing all the phases of the examination. Very good. So to promote financial inclusion, the overall priority sector lending target for urban cooperative banks has been increased from 40% to 75%. Okay. So this is the answer. Okay. Now question number uh, 9 to 10 then again we have a paragraph please start reading okay the union budget 2021-22 has a stress upon the implementation of new education policy 2020 with the setting up of new educational institution across the country in the remote corners and focusing on strengthening the quality of education in existing schools the setting up of the Higher Education Commission will also add a structural reform and streamline the higher education scenario of the country. Allocation of funds towards upskilling of the youths where was imperative. There are other umbrella structure to be created for higher education. So just let me know, English, uh, if you have read the paragraph. Just let me know. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So you have read the paragraph. Now we have a ninth and 10th question both based on this. So as mentioned in the passage, the government has introduced a legislation to set up higher education commission of India as an umbrella body with four separate vehicles, including which of the following. So which of the following are the four separate vehicles that has been included in the new education policy and higher education commission? Standard setting, aggregation, regulation, funding or all of the above. Okay, Nilesh is saying E that is all of the above. Let's see the answer. The answer of this question is all of the above. Very good. Very good. So, the government has introduced a legislation to set up Higher Education Commission of India as an umbrella body with four separate vehicles like standard setting, aggregation, regulation and funding. Okay, so these are the four areas 
and four separate vehicles are there. Now the second question, uh, sorry, a ninth. Okay, I think uh, the tenth question is different question regarding that. Okay, so. We have a 10th question as per the union budget 2021-22 as new central uh, university will be set up in which of the following place Srinagar, Katra, Leh, Kargil or Rajori. A central university will be set up in which of the following places Srinagar, Katra, Leh, Kargil or Rajori. So Nilesh is saying see that is Leh, Leh, Ladda. Okay. So the answer of this question is Leh. Very good, Nilesh. Very good. So, Central University to come up and lay for accessibility to higher education in Ladakh. So, it is a part of that paragraph only. Okay. Now, now we have an 11th question. Under the new education policy 2020, which of the following national assessment center will be set up as a standard setting body? Under the new education policy 2020, which of the following national assessment center will be set up as a standard setting body? Param, Prakash, Praful, Paraksh, none of the above. Under the new education policy, what is Nilesh is saying D, that is P A R A K H. Okay, that is what you are trying to say. Okay, so let's see the answer. The answer of this question is the fourth one, that is correct. Very good, Nilesh. The full form of uh, that is the National Assessment Center Parakh is performance P. Assessment A, review, third, analysis, fourth, fifth is knowledge, sixth is holistic development. So, it is Paraksha will be setting up as national standard setting body. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. Very good. Okay. Now, we have a twelfth question. As per Pakistani economist Magbul ul -Haq, there are four essential pillars of human, human development. Which of the following is not one of them? Equity, opportunity, sustainability, productivity, or empowerment. As per the Pakistani economist Makbul ul Haq, there are four essential pillars of human development. Which of the following is not one of them? Which one of the following is not of them? Equity, opportunity, sustainability, productivity, or empowerment. What is your answer, uh, Nilesh? May I know the answer? You are saying D. Are you saying D? Um, can you just write your answer again? Okay, okay, okay. You are saying D. That is productivity. Okay, let's see the answer. The answer of this question is opportunity. Not one of them. That is, this is not there. This is not there. Opportunities. Okay, equity is there, sustainability is there, productivity is there, empowerment is there, but opportunity is not there. Okay, please uh, just uh, mark it down. Okay, opportunity is not there. Okay, Nilesh, I hope you got the answer right. Now, the, the noted Pakistani economist Makpur Ullah considered four essential pillars for human development. That's our equity, sustainability, productivity, and empowerment. So, equity, it is a development is to enlarge population choices people must enjoy equitable access to the opportunities. People should have, must enjoy equitable access to opportunities. So that is coming under the equity. Okay, these opportunities are coming under equity. Okay, then, then we have sustainability. Is that, that we keep going and it should last long. The concept of sustainable development focusing on the need to maintain the long-term productive capacity of the biosphere. Okay, so we have to keep the uh, our uh, earth in a proper condition. This then suggests that the growth cannot go on indefinitely. So there, of course, there is the limit to growth. So you have to make sure that whatever you are doing, whatever growth you are doing, you should limit your growth. Okay. Then, then we have a productivity. Another component of human development is productivity, which requires investment in people. So here, investment in people is required. That is called called human capital, human capital development. Okay. So investment in human capital in addition to physical capital can add to more productivity. Then we have a fourth option that is empowerment. Human development paradigm envisage full empowerment. We have to provide full empowerment. 
to the peoples empowered means that people are in the position to access their choices of their own on their free will okay so these are the four essential pillars okay now we are moving to the 13th question a little bit larger question so here we have to find out that which are the correct difference between micro and macro economics which of the following statements are correct difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics so microeconomics study individual units of an economy whereas macroeconomics uh, study economy as a whole and its aggregate then microeconomics deal with national income general price level national output whereas macroeconomics deal with individual income individual prices individual output then third one the central problem of microeconomics is price determination and allocation of resources whereas central problem of macroeconomics is determination of level of income and employment the fourth one is the main tool of microeconomics is aggregate demand and aggregate supply of the economy as a whole whereas the main tool of the macroeconomics is the demand and supply of particular commodity factors so choose the correct option which are the correct differences which are the correct differences see uh, the options are a little bit larger but you have to find it out uh, properly which are the correct differences between micro and macroeconomics which are the important which are the important uh, differences between microeconomics and macroeconomics let me know guys okay i am just waiting okay so what nilesh is saying is the option is d that is 1 and 3 so you are saying 1 and 3 is correct so let's see yes the answer is 1 and 3 so here you can work on based on uh, uh, the uh, what we call it as uh, elimination method also okay so very good nilesh uh, you have a uh, you have a basic very good conceptual clarity you have very good conceptual clarity okay so just feel uh, very good i am just feeling very happy for that okay okay now so parameters are uh, first of all how the parameters are determined that is the economic unit how economic unit works that is study individual units of an economy so here in the microeconomics they study individual units in the macroeconomics they study economics as a whole as a aggregate okay okay then scope what is the scope of that so it deals with microeconomics deal with individual income here they deals with national income national price level and everything what is the central problem price determination and allocation of resource is the main main important thing related to microeconomics then in the macroeconomics determination of level of income and employment is the major thing then what are the main tools the main tools of demand and supply of a particular commodity over microeconomics and here is aggregate overall full demand and supply are the as a whole is the main main tool then how is equilibrium analysis a consumer a producer of industries so here we look for level of income and employment okay what some of the examples are individual income individual saving price determination individual firms output consumer equilibrium then we have a in the macroeconomics we have national income national saving aggregate price level aggregate sub demand and supply poverty and then unemployment are already there very good a good uh, conceptual clarity by nilesh very good guy okay now question number 14 growing of maize jowar bajra cowpea is between the row of subbul is an example of which type of multiple cropping augmenting cropping intercropping relay cropping la cropping or companion cropping so growing of maize jowar bajra cowpea in between the rows of subbul is an example of which type of multiple cropping augmenting cropping intercropping relay cropping la cropping or companion cropping so start answering nilesh is saying d that is la cropping okay nilesh is saying d that is la cropping is the answer so let's see what is the answer the answer is la cropping so this comes growing of maize jowar bajra cowpea between the row of subbul okay is coming under la cropping very good so it is all coming under the la cropping very good very good okay 
so the system of growing jowar bajra maize uh, and the other uh, arable crops in the la that is the that la means that is a passage between the two rows between the passage between the two rows you are growing this uh, leguminous crop leguminous crops is usually uh, for nitrogen uh, if there is a deficiency of nitrogen is there so we uh, grow some of the crops that is sababul is a type of crop this is called la cropping okay Growing jowar, bajra, bajra, cowpea in between the row of subagul planted five to ten meters spacing in this system is useful for conservation of moisture and maintaining of the fertility of soil in dry farming areas. The looping of subagul are used as green fodder for animal or spread between the cow rows. So, how many types of LA croppings are there? So, food come fodder system. So, what kind of LA cropping we can do? One can be food and one can be fodder. Food come mulch system, food come pole system. So what come food and come fodder system is? In this system, we grow uh, food grain like pulses, cereals, oil grain, and fodder uh, for livestock. Okay. Then food come mulch system. In this system, which provide food grain and well as well as crop residue as a mulch for soil and water conservation. Then food come pole system. In this system, which provides food as well as wood for fuel, timber, and furniture. Okay. So this is what it is a early cropping method. Okay, then question number fifteen. Downward movement of nutrients and salt from the root zone with the water is called seepage, leaching, percolation, infiltration, or all of the above. Downward movement of nutrients and salt from the root zone with the water is called what? So Nilesh is saying, see that is percolation, downward movement of nutrients and salts from the root zone. From the root zone, the there is a downward movement of nutrition and salt has also taken place. So what is that called? Okay, Nilesh is saying, see that is uh, C that is percolation, but the answer is leaching. The answer is leaching. Okay. In agriculture, leaching refers to the loss of water-soluble plants' nutrition from the soil due to rain and irrigation. Soil structure, crop planting type of application, rate of fertilizer, and other factors are taken into account to avoid excess nutrition loss. Okay, so normally it is that. Okay. Now, question number sixteen. Some little bit of technical question. Okay, which of the following is the characteristic of saline soil? Please read the options and answer it. Which of the following is the characteristics of a saline soil? How much EPS? How much uh, EC electrical conductivity? Then how much EPS is required? Okay, so let me know. How? Which of the following are the characteristics of saline soil? Anybody answering? <clears throat> okay, uh, so the answer of this question is option number one that is EP should be less than fifteen, PA should be less than eight point two. Okay, and EC should be more than four dS. That is electrical conductivity. Okay, so the answer is in saline soil, electrical conductivity should be more than four dS per meter, and exchangeable so uh, sodium percentage, that is EPS, should be less than fifteen, and PS should also be less than eight point two. Okay, now we are moving to the question number seventeen and uh, seventeen and nineteen. So. It is a paragraph in March 2016. Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced doubling farmer income by 2022. This policy replaced increasing food production as a main focus, but the goal of doubling farmer income was criticized by many experts as unachievable, even as they lauded the shift in the priorities. Okay. Since the onset of the Green Revolution in the late 1960s, India has purchased policies. Uh, Focused almost entirely on ensuring national food security by the early 20s, uh, 2000s, 
Productivity per hectare of a staple crop, wheat and rice has grown steadily and total food gain productivity has more than doubled. The green revolution policies have however failed in raising farmer income, especially for the small and marginal activity. So if you have read the paragraph, just let me know in the chat box. Just let me know in the chat box if you have read the paragraph. If you have read the paragraph, just let me know in the chat box. And based on this, I have to ask questions 17 and 19. If you have read the chat box, just let me know. Okay, anybody there? Has have you read the chat? Have you read the paragraph, guys? Just let me know. Okay, then I am going uh, for answering the question. Uh, question, I am just going for the question. Okay, the first question is, choose the correct statement among the following. Rice cultivation is started from the end of monsoon. SRI is a methodology for increasing rice yield. Third one, Puja Ojala is a variety of rice grown in India. Fourth, Gujarat is the largest producer of rice in India. Or fifth one, none of the above are correct. So, choose the correct statement among the following. Rice cultivation is started from the end of monsoon. SRI is a methodology for increasing rice yield. Pusa Ojala is a variety of rice grown in India. Gujarat is the largest producer of rice in India or none of the above. So, may I know the answer guys? Choose the correct statement. Here, you have to choose the correct statement. Choose the correct statement. Choose the correct statement regarding this question. Come on guys, those who are there, they can answer this question. Just let me know. Guys, just let me know. Those who wanted to answer this, they can simply answer it fast enough. Guys, fast, fast, fast. Come on. Come on guys, come on, come on, come on. Okay, so the answer of this question is, the correct statement is, SRI is the methodology for increasing the yield, rice yield. SRI is a methodology for increasing the rice yield. Okay, so rice is a kharif crop. The cropping season of kharif crop starts from the onset of the monsoon when the monsoon starts and it ends when the rainy season is over. On the other hand, the rabi crops are grown in the winters. That is, it is sown when the monsoon ends and it is harvested before the summer season. So, system of rice intensification, that is SRI, okay, has demonstrated in several states the ability to save water while raising yield in the cost-effective manner. Around 60% of the country rice area is irrigated, accounting for 75% of the production, but also by guzzling disproportionately large volume of water. HD 1605 that is also called Pusa Ujala in the name is a variety of wheat where, uh, where which is famous for his ability for resistance to the black and brown rust and also has a good level of resistance to flag must, carnal burnt, leaf blind and foot root diseases and West Bengal is the country in the country is the which is producing highest quantity of rice production in the state. Okay. So this is the answer. SRI stands for System of Rice Intensification. Now question number 18 uh, related to that. Which of the following is the lead agencies for implementing of ENAM under Agriculture Ministry? So which of the following is the lead agency? Which of the following will be, is a lead agency for implementation of ENAM under the Agriculture Ministry? A small far farmers agribusiness consortium, agri farmer consortium, Farmers Producer Organization, Consortium of Indian Farmers, Central Consortium of Farmers. So, which of the following is the lead agencies for implementing ENAM under Agriculture Ministry? Anybody who know the answer, they can just write in the chat box. They can just simply write in the chat box. Which of the following is the lead agency for implementing ENAM under Agriculture Ministry? Okay, so let's see the answer. The answer of this question is Small Farmer Agribusiness Consortium. 
that is the first option a small farmer agri business consortium is the answer of this question okay so a small farmer agri business consortium is the lead agencies for implementation of the enam under the ministry of agriculture and farmer welfare so enam is a pan india electronic trading portal with network of existing apmcs mondays to create a unified national market for agriculture commodities okay now now we are moving to the question number 19 National Seed Research and Training Center that is NSRTC is situated in Dash which is an epic center to maintain the uniformity in seed testing result in India National Seed Research and Training Center is situated in which city of our country which is an epic center to maintain the uniformity in seed testing result in India Mumbai, Lucknow, Varanasi, Hyderabad, or Bhopal. Where is this National Seed Research and Test Training Center is situated? Anybody else knowing the answer? Just let me know in the chat box. Okay, uh, so let's see. Okay, so the answer of this question is Varanasi. The answer of this question is Varanasi. So this uh, National Seed Research and Training Center is located in Vara. nasi it is situated in varanasi okay the answer is varanasi okay then ministry of agriculture and farmer welfare prishi bhavan national delhi has started the national seed research and training center varanasi during october 20, 2005 the prime objective of establishment of nsrtc is to have a separate national seed control laboratory which serves as a central seed testing laboratory cstl okay no question number 20 which of the following statement is incorrect here which of the following statement is incorrect with the reference to new education policy 2020 the policy has emphasized mother tongue local languages regional language as a medium of instruction at least till grade 5 but preferably till grade 8 and beyond sanskrit to be offered at all levels of schools and higher education as an option for a student including in the four language formulas other classical language and literature of india also be available as option no language will be imposed on any student several foreign language will also be offered at the secondary level so which of the following is not correct which of the following is not correct regarding the new education policy which of the following is not correct regarding the new education policy which of the following is not correct regarding the new education policy so uh, let's see the answer the answer is answer number 2 this is incorrect okay option number 2 is incorrect okay sanskrit is to be offered at all levels of schools and higher education as an option for a student including in the four language formulas okay so this option is incorrect rest all are correct okay so the policy the policy has emphasized mother tongue local languages regional language as a medium of instruction till grade 5 and it should be preferably till grade 8 you can utilize sanskrit should be offered at all levels of schools and higher education other classical language and literature of india also available as option no language will be imposed on anybody okay a student to participate in the fun project activities like the language of india sometimes in grade 6 to 8 ek bharat shreshth bharat several foreign languages will be also offered as secondary level india sign language will be standardized across the country national and state curriculum material and by to, for the use for student with hearing impairments okay so this is the answer question number 21 an implement used for opening and loosening of the soil is known as what is the name of the implement that is used for opening and loosening of the soil what is that implement is known as cultivar harrow plough hoe or none of the above an implement used for opening and loosening of the soil is known as what cultivar harrow plough hoe or none of the above what is the answer for this an implement used for opening and loosening of the soil is known as what cultivar harrow plough hoe none of the above anybody who knows the answer they can just simply answer that 
Okay, so uh, the answer of this question is the answer of this question is plough. Plough. Plough is the answer of this. Okay. Oh, Nilesh, you are back. Where have you been? <laughs> I was waiting. Lots of question we have already discussed. Okay, so I thought you might you have also left the session. Okay, so the answer of this question is plough. Okay. Very good. So, implement used for opening and loosening of the soil is known as plough. Plough are used for primary tillage. So, they are usually for primary tillage. The, the, the prime purpose of ploughing is to turn over the uppermost soil, bringing fresh nutrients on the surface while burying the uh, weeds. Okay, okay, no problem, no problem. Okay. Uh, Nilesh, uh, internet issues are there. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay. And crop remains to decay. Okay. So it protects the from, uh, from uh, uh, weeds and all those things. And also it will bring the fresh nutrients to the uppermost soil. So trenches cut by the plough are called furrows. Okay. So plough are of three types. Wooden plough or indigenous plough, which we use uh, in the older uh, times. Then we have iron or inversion plough, which is there. Uh, on the tractors and all okay then we have a special purpose plough that is used for different type of crops okay now we have question number 22 according to economic survey 2020 21 which of the following is scheme is or are recently launched by the international solar alliance isa to encourage solar power generation globally one sun one world one grid World Solar Bank, World Independent Power Project, 4th, 1 and 2 or 5th, 2 and 3. So, which one of this is correct as per International Solar Alliance? So, Nilesh is saying B, that is 2 and 3. Pankaj, okay, Pankaj, okay, at last someone has come. Pankaj is saying 1, that is, so, uh, that is 1 sun, 1 world, 1 grid, okay. So, here... Uh, both of you are incorrect because the answer is 1 and 2. These two schemes have been launched. One sun, one world, one grid and world solar bank. So, these two things have been launched by International Solar Alliance. These two, two things have been launched by International Solar Alliance. Okay. This is the first uh, uh, International Solar Alliance whose headquarter is in India, Gurgaon. Okay. So, the answer is one sun, one world, one grid and world solar bank is there. Okay. Now, International Solar Alliance has recently launched two schemes that is world solar bank and one sun, one world, one grid to increase solar power generation globally. World solar bank aims to provide a dedicated financing, okay, windows for solar project across the member International Solar Alliance areas. Okay. Now, we have question number 23. As per Social Economic Caste Census 2021, what is the number of rural household in India? 18.5 crore, 19.68 crore, 20.36 crore, 24.96 crore, 17.9 crore. So, Nilesh is saying D, that is 24.96 crore. Okay, 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 Nilesh. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's okay, it's okay. I, I was just not able to... Yes, option number D. Okay, okay. Got it, got it. Okay. It's okay. Fine. <laughs> Just got confused. Good, 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 good answering. So, Nilesh is saying 24.96 rural households are there as per socio-economic caste census 2021. So, but here uh, it is 17.9. Here 17.9 household. As per the data released by Social Economic Caste Census, the number of total household in India. In India, there are 24.36, out of which 17.9 are the rural areas household. Okay. Okay. Out of these, around 73% of all household in countries are from the rural areas. And out of the total rural household, 10.7 crore live in a very deprived areas. Okay. So the answer is 17.9 crore. 17.9 crore is ruler household and total household in India are 24.39 crores. Okay. Total households. Okay. Now, <clears throat> question number 24. Question number 24 is which of the following is the use of power tillers in agriculture? Which of the following is the use of power tiller in agriculture? Sowing, spraying, harvesting, puddling or all of the above. Which of the following is the use of power tillers in agriculture? What is the purpose of 
use of power tillers in agriculture sowing spraying harvesting puddling or all of the above may i know the answer guys which of the following is the use of power tillers in agriculture pankaj is saying one that is sowing okay anybody else nilesh wanted to answer nilesh is saying c that is harvesting use of power tillers the main use is all of the above power tiller are used for all of the above things sowing spraying harvesting and puddling okay so the power tiller is a two wheeled agriculture implement fitted with rotary tillers which give a smooth resistance to all farm activities power tiller is a prime movers in which the direction of pf travel uh, and uh, its control for field operation is performed by the operator walking behind it the in agriculture power tiller are used for ploughing sowing spraying harvesting puddling and transport work it is the most wanted machine for puddling operation in rice cultivations okay so the answer is all of the above now the last question for today is the non depth receipt comprises which of the following receipts the non depth capital uh, the non depth receipts comprises of which of the following this tax revenues non tax revenues non debt capital disinvestment revenue all of the above the non debt receipt comprises of which of the following receipts tax revenue non tax revenue non capital non debt capital disinvestment revenue or all of the above So Nilesh is saying, I think all non-debt receipt, non-debt. That is mean the receipt which are creating non-debt, which are not creating any kind of liabilities. Okay, so the answer of this question is all of the above. Very good. Because these are all creating the revenue, but they are not creating any kind of debt because they are not creating any kind of liability on the government. Okay, disinvestment will also give the money to the government. Non-debt capital that means there is no debt on that. Okay, then non-tax revenue are also getting money. Tax revenue they are also getting money. Okay, so non-debt receipt are the receipt which doesn't incur any further repayment burden for the government. On the other hand, the debt receipt are those which are to be repaid by the government borrowing the debt receipt. Other receipt in the budget are non-debt receipt. Uh, so non-debt receipt. The non-debt receipt comprises tax or non-tax revenue and non-debt capital receipt like recovery of loans and disinvestment receipt. So the answer is all. So these are the total twenty-five questions that we have discussed today. If anyone wanted to ask any question, they can ask. Okay, we have reached to the last of our session. So anybody has any kind of question, they can just simply ask right away. Okay, anybody, anybody who has any kind of questions, any question they can ask regarding examination. And twenty uh, days, I think twenty days are left for your uh, NABARD Grade A examination phase two. So uh, yesterday, one lecture that has been done uh, by Riti Ma'am, how you can uh, do uh, the preparation, how is the uh, special preparation strategy she has shared with uh, all of you. Please go there. Okay, we are also coming out with a new. Uh, 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 lectures uh, for the NABARD examination, so do attend that also. Okay, and please attend the mock test that we are providing you in the NABARD for a NABARD examination in our uh, portal. So please go there and write the examination over there. I will be only checking that, and I will be giving you the reviews over there. Okay, so uh, at the last, thank you everyone. Uh, never forget to like, subscribe, and follow. Happy learning! Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. It was a huge. Uh, A great session and uh, people were less, but uh, it's okay because they might be preparing for the examination. Please go through these lectures once you have finished, okay? Because these are the questions that are also important. Till then, never forget to like, subscribe, and follow. Happy learning! Thank you so much. Bye bye. Take care. Good night.